Hey guys, thanks for joining me. Uh, I, what a privilege to read the word together, grow together. Uh, listen, um, we're looking at Timothy chapter 2. It's a very short chapter. What do we got? 15 verses. Considered a very polemic chapter, a very controversial chapter because it talks about women and their role a little bit. I think there is understanding for us here, especially where we find ourselves in society today. So we'll break it down, but let's just pray. Let's read. I'll share a few thoughts. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can come to your word. Lord, you said that your Holy Spirit would teach us all things. John 14, 26, that you would give us wisdom where we lack it. James 1, 5. And I just pray, Lord, even now as we read this passage, humble our hearts, humble our hearts, but God, give us discernment that we wouldn't be like Pharisees that are uh, locked in and holding to rules and regulations where, where they didn't matter, where your words are spirit and life. I pray you give us crystal clear, deep understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's just read it, and then I'll share a few of my thoughts with you. Paul writing to Timothy, chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a warm woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. All right. Let me share a few things, my thoughts on this. And uh, maybe I'll type in the notes at the bottom of the video, or maybe you can take notes, you know, just of some of the scriptures I'm going to reference. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, explain bound all of them. I'm just uh, going to reference some of them. There are things in scripture that are culturally uh, bound, and there are things that aren't. Okay, so like a lot of Old Testament rules around cooking and cleaning, things like that, uh, were uh, rules of God for the health of the people, but they were culturally and almost scientifically bound. It, they would have been different if they had had running water heated water in the homes, etc., etc., right? Uh, hygienic products, etc., etc. God would not have had to give them directives on boiling certain things or, you know. Then there are things in Scripture that are not culturally bound, such as moral issues. That's why when we look through Scripture, uh, the issues around God's commands on morality are consistent start to finish heterosexual immorality homosexual immorality lying 
cheating. These things are just consistent all the way through, right? There's nothing that chops and changes. Or let, let me just say, we don't have any precedents where God changes standards on those things, not, not in directives or commands. We don't have seasons where God was okay with immorality in the church or where homosexuality in this is let slide, right? Now, with other things, we discern, right? And, and a powerful passage, a powerful verse, 2 Corinthians 8, 21, Paul said, I am taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of God, but also in the eyes of men. That's interesting. I'm taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of God, but also in the eyes of men. And he goes on, I think it's 1 Corinthians 9, talking about, I am weak to those who are weak, so that I may win some. To those who are not under the law, I am as one not under the law to win some. Very interesting. So, in a funny way, the ebb and the flow of reaching people changes when Paul is trying to do what is right in the eyes of men. Well, in the eyes of men, where it doesn't violate God's law, right, morals and whatnot, in the eyes of men, that's going to change in different cultures, different settings, you know. Uh, you, you don't want to offend people, so in this society... Men will not go shirtless, or women will tend to cover their heads, right? Because there's a cultural thing at work, and we don't want to lose people for dissing their culture and dissing what they consider a proprietus, okay? Now, in this society, when Paul's writing to this church, we see, we see in Scripture, now I know I said at the beginning of 1 Timothy, we don't need a whole lot of cultural context. We really don't. And now, it helps, folks. I'm not trying to diss that, but I'm saying Paul is explicit about the issues. If you read in Corinthians, he's saying there's disorder among you. There's confusion among you, right? Here, Paul is, is, is saying, look, we need to keep the order, right? And you see, in the church of Christ, there seemed to be this unshackling of people coming free from the law, as they should be. So, in the temple, where men and women would have been separated, they're no longer separated in the Christian church, and nor should they be, because Galatians 3.28, Paul says, In Christ there is no longer male nor female. Okay, we and it says in Ephesians 2, 14 to 15, God destroyed the dividing barrier, making the two one. That could be anything. Uh, the, the slave and the free, as he refers to in Galatians 3, 8, male and female, circumcised, uncircumcised, right? God destroyed the dividing barrier. So now we have all these people coming together. In a way, we have the learned and the unlearned because men would have been schooled in all these theological things women wouldn't have been. And I think Paul is trying to retain order. Listen, when you come together to worship, don't have, don't, don't men, uh, women start asking their the people all these multiple questions and speaking out and, and, and where we're disregarding the order in society that looks orderly and is traditional. We, we, we don't want to disrespect the societal norms. We don't want to come out of culture, Monday to Friday, so so or into the Christian church, and it's chaos, right? Like, who are you? I'm. You're not in charge of me. I'm in charge of you. So he says to the women, ask your husband these things at home, these things you don't know. Now, <laughs> now, things have changed. Women know things that men don't know. Women are going to theological school. They might study all kinds of things in the Bible that men don't know. I think if, the, if, it, if it had been the reverse, if there had been disorder where men didn't know things and they were shouting out in the service or they were disrupting order and asking questions, he would be saying the same thing. Men, ask your wives at home about these things, right? The church, we need to retain order. Do you remember there's another passage about even the communion bread? it started getting out of hand, where people started kind of feasting, and some had feasts and others didn't, almost like people bringing big picnics and others have no food to eat. He's like, that's not what it's about. Eat at home. When you come together, it's about fellowship and order. It's not about you have lots of food, you don't have lots of food. So even on the communion, 
issue. Disorder had broken out and there had been divides based on cultural wealth. And he's like, get, get that out of here. He, he also talks about uh, how the, there was this overly deferential uh, kind of disposition towards rich people coming into church. And he's saying, if you honor a rich man, but you make the poor man sit at the back. He's like, come on now. We need to, the, the, the church of God, is, the house of worship is about something different. And we need to respect societal norms. Now, look, one reason I'm saying this cannot be about God's view on women in leadership is because it's not consistent through scripture. This, this speaks to a time and a place and a bit of chaos, right? He's like, let's put this back in order. We're trying to take what, do, take pains to do what's right. Not only as a God, but also in the eyes of society. We can't come in here and then suddenly show out. There's order. Deborah, Judges chapter 4 and 5. She was a prophetess leading Israel. Not the women of Israel. All of Israel. So this cannot be, you know, reflective of men or women teaching men. Deborah was judging men. Also, listen, some people look at the, the order set out in 1 Corinthians 12. Towards the end of 1 Corinthians 12, it says it, God has given first apostles, then prophets, then teachers. Some people see those as a hierarchy. Honestly, I don't really. That loosely, maybe. But if that's what we're looking at, then you got apostles, prophets, teachers. you got prophets higher than teachers. So here it's saying women shouldn't teach a man. But what if these women were prophetic? Do they teach the teachers? Because we're told in Acts 2, when God poured out his spirit on the people, Acts 2, 17 to 18, quoting Joel chapter 2, that God would pour out his spirit on your sons and daughters, and even on your male and female slaves. Prophecy. It says they would have a spirit of prophecy on them. So you got a female slave with a spirit of prophecy. Does she teach the teachers here? Because under the apostles are prophets. Does she teach the teachers, but then there can be no women teachers? How about Philip's four daughters in Acts? Oh, is it Acts 21? He had four daughters. They were all prophets. Prophets. Can they not teach? Can they not speak and lead the teachers and the people of church? Only the women? Well, no. What about Deborah judging the whole of Israel? What about your, your female sons and daughters having the Spirit of God and the prophetic on them? And then 1 Corinthians 12, prophetic under apostles. There's no distinctions. Male and female. Who else do we have? Holy mo, we, we honestly, folks, so this can't, it isn't a consistent moral issue. It's definitely a cultural issue at the beginning of the church, some disorder. We now don't have all these legal constraints. And so in the church, there was some disorder. Paul's like, let's put it back in order. He's not saying women can't braid their hair. He's saying the beauty of women should come from the soul, and they, they do need to be modest. That's, that's great. I have to tell my own daughter, but dress modestly. It's, it's, this is science. This isn't oppression. It's like we need to, you know, and Paul is saying the same. He's not trying to suppress women's natural beauty. How could that be? God blessed Job after Job's first family had died. He blessed him with the most beautiful daughters in all the land. We're not talking about good works here. Beauty is a thing, it's kind of like, you know, it's a thing God has given women. It's natural. He's not trying to oppress it or suppress it. He's saying we're now of a different kingdom and the beauty should be one of spirit and godliness. Men should be raising up holy hands of prayer, not in anger. Is he saying that they literally need to raise their hand? No, and I don't think... Interestingly, interestingly, just dawned on me, a lot of the men that would maybe use this passage oppressively about women, etc., probably don't raise their hands in church, which is interesting. Literal one thing that suits them, not literal another thing. Here's another thing. Make intercessions, supplications for kings. When was the last time you prayed for a king? Why? Because we don't have kings. 
But we understand that intuitively. He's talking about the leaders of the time. So we culturally adjust for that. But we, you know, sometimes we fail to discern other areas of scripture that should be culturally you know, discerned. And if it's not a moral issue that's consistent, if it's if it's a time and a place. So this issue around women, Gentiles, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Gentiles. Who are Gentiles anymore? That category is not as distinct anymore. But we know what he means. Right? So uh, this passage, folks, I really feel, I really feel is not about uh women in leadership in that way it's a time and a place it's about order it's about true beauty it's about men being holy women being holy we got the precedents and the teachings about women even being prophetic the prof prophetess anna luke chapter 2 we got plenty of gifted anointed women teaching men throughout scripture so that is not what this means in terms of definitive church paradigm the church that meets in the house of Lydia, Paul writes, it was Lydia and Philippi. She went, established the church in her home. How? So the question isn't about can women teach. It's just not. The question is what is God doing? Who is God calling? And are we being obedient to that? Let me tell you something. From a personal point of view, per, just personal, I'm not saying this is how it should be, but not many women want to be leaders and teachers in church. It's a pain in the backside. It's, 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 it's draining. It, it's, not, it's not kind of a natural egotistical drive of women. It can be for men. We get a whole lot of false men teaching because they want power. Women typically who are leadership quality in churches can't help it. They're anointed and called. So the question isn't can women teach? The question is who's called to teach? Is it a woman? Is it a man? God has poured out his spirit on women and men. Acts 2, 17 to 18. And in this context, I believe Paul was saying, let's get some order here. Let's not fall into disrepute in the eyes of society around us. And we do have to change with some cultural norms. Actually, it says in 1 Corinthians, I'll try and find the passage, that men should not cover their head and prophesy or pray. I, our worship leader will often pray, still has his baseball cap on. Have you ever prayed with your baseball cap on? Why? Well, well we, we're like, well, it's amazing how forgiving and how culturally adjusting we are for ourselves, right? I'll put these scriptures down. These are These are legit. So this women's issue, folks, it needs to be read in context of the whole Bible, which says there are women who are prophets, judges of the whole nation, prophets in the church, in the New Testament church, Philip's daughters, etc., etc. So what does Paul really mean here? He's like, let's pull things into order here. I also think, I mean, I could go deeper and deeper in it, but, you know, where he says that women will be saved through childbearing, I think he's... In the same way, he, he, he admonishes men to be men who work, 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 to 11, and other places. Um, those are the curses, right? So, man, the, the toil, the land was cursed, and food would come forth from the sweat of our brow. And he, I think he's saying if men will work, be good, honorable, working men, do be, be, be. There, there's a holiness in just engaging the processes of God, not you know, they don't save the soul necessarily, but they're healthy, they're, they're appropriate. And he's saying to women, I believe, this passage uh, where he's saying you'll be saved through childbearing. Is that First uh, Timothy 2.15? She'll be saved through childbearing. I think it's like, look, this was the punishment. This was the curse. Childbearing is such a deep, significant ministry. It's, the, it's a near-death experience to give life. You, you engage and and and. and and, and be in the zone of, of how God has created your path as a woman, right? To, to, you know, you bear children and you nearly die to give life. You're, you're, you're fine. You don't have to be knowing all the theology. You don't have to be doing all the extra ministry. You, you are saved and sanctified and just walking with God in the, the way he's formed you. And the truth would be the same of men too. Live quiet lives. Work with your hands so that you're not dependent on anyone. First Thessalonians 4, 10 to 11. 
I think where there would be a lot of disorder, God would be saying the same thing. Man, don't be idle. We see this. Uh, we see this. Uh, warn those who are idle. Did we just cover that in Luke? Or where did we cover it? But, you know, men also are called to be industrious in that zone of kind of the curse, the punishment, the destiny on men. You've got to work hard to live. Women, you're going to suffer in childbearing. And that is... And so I think this passage is more about release, I'll be honest. Women, you don't have to know all the answers now. You don't have to panic. You don't have to get in charge in church. You don't have to now. If you're called and anointed, praise God. But you don't, you're worthy as you are. Just being a woman, a woman of God and suffering and childbearing, it's, you're saved already just doing that. It's so intense. Women are amazing. And uh, they shouldn't have to prove themselves more spiritually than just being a godly woman. And I feel it's the same with men, honestly. If we would be content and not so prideful, we're always trying to prove ourselves and we don't have to either. You know? So I think Paul is saying here, and I think God is saying here, calm down. Get some order in place. But it's not meant to be a passage that becomes oppressive. To churches, it's supposed to be releasing, like all scripture, and it's become a baseball bat to beat people over the heads with and and stitch up new ways of legalism. No, no, Lord Jesus, give us wisdom. Help us not misappropriate your word. First Timothy, uh, Second Timothy, two fifteen. Don't mishandle the word of truth, Timothy. This is not supposed to bind people up. It's supposed to set people free. Culture changes. So does some of the. The issues of propriety, therefore. And so we take pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of God, also in the eyes of men. If Christian women started going around covering their heads, which none of society does anymore, which all of society did there, none of society do that anymore. Why are you doing it? It suddenly now does not look like something appropriate or modest. It looks oppressive because it is oppressive. So now are we taking pains to do what's right in the eyes of men by making women cover their heads? No, we're, we're being bound by something completely culturally irrelevant, but we're doing it out of legalism, and it's not right in the eyes of men. In fact, it's oppressive, and it turns people off Jesus Christ. Lord, give us discernment between what's cultural and what is truly timeless and moral. Timeless and moral, but what has changed and needs to be put aside so that we can win some. All right, we'll leave it there. God bless you guys.